afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure on behalf of Banque de Luxembourg to welcome everyone to our beautiful auditorium today. I would like to extend a special welcome to our guest of honor, Mr. Franz Fayot, Minister for Development Cooperation and Humanitarian Affairs of Luxembourg, as well as to Dr. Hanning from the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, and to Patrick Loche, Chairman of ADA, Appui au Développement Autonome. They will all be speaking today. A special welcome also to those who are following us on uh, YouTube. After being confined for more than two years now, so to speak, uh, even though Luxembourg fared relatively better, we are so excited to have you all here to participate in the 54th Midi de la Microfinance, organized by the NGO ADA. Today's high-level panel will address the socioeconomic integration of young people with innovative financing mechanisms and business skill training. Our distinguished speakers will also discuss the different challenges faced by women entrepreneurs in developing countries. But before leaving the floor to the panel, allow me to say a few words on Banque de Luxembourg and its implication uh, in microfinance. For more than a decade now, we have been developing investment vehicles dedicated to microfinance and impact investing in general. Inclusive finance and gender equality in particular have always constituted the core of our investments in the microfinance industry. We've been funding entities such as Fundbodem, Fundación Boliviana para el Desarrollo de la Mujer in Bolivia, the Kenya Women Finance Trust, or KWFT in Kenya, Promujer in Latin America, and uh, MBK in Indonesia. Those are some examples of MFIs targeting women exclusively. We also made it possible for our clients to meet practitioners from the industry and understand the real purpose of the investments at the bottom of the pyramid. Innovative mechanisms mustn't take place only at the level of micro-entrepreneurs. In order for our clients to be able to take part to those impactful projects occurring sometimes in the least developed countries, we at Banque de Luxembourg had to develop the best solution possible that would allow the participation of investors from this part of the world in the generation of impact in the southern part of the planet, mitigating the risk doing so while maximizing the impact. Since our first investment in 2009, we have evolved in the solution we've been presenting our clients with. The latest being our first social bond, soon to be listed on the Luxembourg Green Exchange. But this isn't the topic of our gathering today. So let me thank you again for being here or online today. And without further ado, please welcome our panel's moderator, Mr. Gerhard Kutsi from CGAP. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Philippe Donge. Uh, we appreciate your kind words of introduction and the fact that the Banque de Luxembourg is hosting us here today. Um, good afternoon and welcome again to the 54th Midi de la Microfinance. And uh, my name is Gerard Kutsia. I work for the consultative group to assist the poor. And uh, f uh, in that uh, job, I focus on the demand side, uh, on, on the people that we are doing this for. So people is my passion. But it's not about me today. It's about these three gentlemen and the messages that they are going to uh, bring to us. So firstly, one in every three persons across the world today is what we refer to as the youth. 15 to 34 years old. In my, on my continent, Africa, we are going to have by 2050 the most young people that are employable in the world in one continent. So it brings great challenges. And to address those challenges of finding economic and social inclusion for the young people of the world, we have three distinguished panelists. 
And let me just remind you, before I introduce them, is that what we are going to ask them is each will give us a four-minute introduction, uh, and then after that, we are going to go to questions. Some questions that you've already sent us before, and some questions that we uh, want them to address. And uh, we are going to go slightly over one o'clock, slightly over one o'clock. So I know a lot of you will get nervous when we go over time, but slightly over one o'clock. And, um, and uh, that brings me to introducing my panel. So firstly, I want to introduce uh, Minister Franz Fayot. Minister for Development, Cooperation and Humanitarian Affairs of Luxembourg today, but he also has another hat, uh, and, uh, and to, but we're not addressing that today. So, Minister Fayot uh, um, attended the Athenee de Luxembourg uh, for school studies, then went on and studied at the postgraduate, uh, a postgraduate diploma of advanced studies, in corporate law, now here I must call it a DEA, so people say it's important that I must say it's a DEA, at a very good university, Pantheon Sorbonne in Paris, in 1996. He has been in politics since a long time, 94, for the Luxembourg um, Socialist Workers Party, and he was the chair of that party, chairman of that party, the last few years until February 2020, when he was called for duty in the uh, government, joint government by three parties uh, following a coalition. Long career in politics. Uh, as I said, he focused on, over his career on public finance, cultural policy, as well as social justice and policy issues. It makes you absolutely the person we want to listen to today, Mr. Fayot. And uh, I heard him speak before, he doesn't know it, but when he was in Kigali in uh, uh, 21, uh, speaking at SAM 21, I listened in from South Africa. So uh, I look forward to listen to you again. Second speaker today is uh, not you, Alfred, but uh, <laughs> Patrick, Patrick Klosch. And... Uh, he uh, studied in political economy in Bonn, project management uh, after that, and held, m held many positions in the automotive uh, world before he decided he wants to make a contribution on his own, became an a, a impact investor, uh, started uh, his passion for forestry, in the form of uh, the Forestry and Climate Change Fund, uh, way before its time, and uh, also serve on many boards. But what I like most about Patrick is that he farms today. He is a forester. He practices what he preaches. So great stuff. Thanks, Patrick. And then last but not least, a man I know for many years, Dr. Alfred Hanik. He is responsible for... Um, AFI, not AFI today only, AFI since 2005, in the design of AFI, 2008, the start of AFI. So when you look at Alfred and you look at AFI, it's two sides of the same coin. Uh, but what is interesting about Alfred is that he is uh, not only the public face of AFI, he really digs into managing, supporting and guiding AFI for many, many years. Uh, and, he, and his CV says he takes an active role in championing the network's global policy leadership. Uh, we, um, we think uh, the leader on all fronts in AFI. So, uh, uh, Alfred, very nice to see you here. I didn't mention that we met each other in 1998 in uh, Kampala, Uganda. So, that's where we go back to. But that is... Um, uh, uh, all on our panelists, and I really appreciate your time. I now turn to you for introductory remarks, Mr. Fayot. The floor is yours. You are welcome to do that. Thanks. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is a pleasure to be um, 
uh, in this auditorium today uh, with you, and thank you very much uh, to Ada for the invitation to speak here today. I was um, an auditor to some of the Midi de la Microfinance uh, many years ago, and so it is truly a pleasure and, and an honor to be speaking here today uh, as a participant uh, to this panel. One of the many challenges we face in developing countries uh, is high un unemployment. High unemployment undermines um, the efforts we do to build a sound governance, but it also fuels insecurity and, extrem and extremism in many of the countries in which we are active. We see that very keenly, in particular in the Sahel region, where you, as you know, which is our main um, target region of Luxembourg's development corporation. And we, we see that um, unemployment has gone up even further with COVID-19. When you go to our partner countries, as I have done in the past um, two years, you see that, um, in particular, the informal economy, which is the main economy in these countries, has been particularly hard hit by the pandemic. And of course, as a matter of course, unemployment has gone up. So the first question that has been asked for me to address in these introductory remarks is, what is the strategy of development cooperation in addressing that um, challenge and that situation? Well, I would decline that in four uh, points. The first point, I think, is an obvious. It is to continue to build the inclusive finance ecosystem that we have been building in Luxembourg over the last past, over the past two decades, and which today is a thriving and a very complete ecosystem, which is also, I would like to say, one of our uh, main value propositions when we talk to our multilateral partners, but also to our, to our partner countries. The input we can bring, bring in inclusive finance is uh, truly unique um, with all the actors, some of which are represented here on the panel today. The second point is to continue that what something that, that we have been doing for a very long time, which is to continue investing in education and vocational training, a long-standing priority of Luxembourg's development cooperation. We have to empower uh, young people, we have to em empower them, give them a good basic education, but, but also, of course, vocational training to make them fit for uh, employment. And then, going with that, and there, allow me to put on the other hat, which you couldn't even mention in your introduction, <laughs> that of <laughs> Minister of Economy, uh, it is also to create new economic opportunities in developing countries, because it is not enough to form people, to train people to something, but they also have to have perspectives um, and for, a, for a job and perspectives of creating their own uh, business in, a, a, uh, in, in an economic sector that exists in these countries. So that is truly a cha a cha another challenge that I would like to develop and I th where I think I have a particular um, sensitivity as Minister of Economy. How do we want to do that? There are different means of doing it. One of them, of course, is capacity building and there uh, you have uh, tools like ICT, digitization, which are obvious and which are also a very strong instrument to allow leapfrogging of certain things in developing countries. And I'm thinking there in particular about fintech. Not everybody has an, a bank account uh, in our partner countries, but most people have a smartphone. And a lot of the things that we can do to empower people is through new technologies and, of course, combining that with finance to uh, create new opportunities and access uh, to financing uh, different, different forms and tools uh, of financing uh, instruments. So digitization is an, is an obvious thing that we are developing in, in our actions. The second axis, I would say, is green economy, sustainable agriculture, circular economy, renewable energies. These are all things that are strongly developing in all our partner countries and which we would like to encourage and which are also more and more part of our indic ind indicative cooperation programs in all our uh, partner countries. And then, very important point, um, which is uh, something that I think in Luxembourg would, should be obvious. We need to involve the so-called traditional finance uh, in our action. 
we cannot achieve the, uh, the SDGs only through ODA. We need to involve traditional finance. We need to harness uh, the investors that want to invest into, <coughs> and into SRA, SRI instruments, and we need to put that to work for um, precisely young people, for the youth that want to create businesses in the developing world. That is also something that we are very strongly working on and which I'm sure we'll come back to during, uh, during the panel. Then, uh, fourth and uh, maybe last point, and I will stop there. Um, panel is not a perfect image for that, but still, it's gender. Uh, we, need, we need to work on, uh, on, on gender. We need to realize that we need to empower uh, young women uh, we need to empower women uh, in the developing world. We all know, you all know, that that is um, a key factor to achieving success, uh, and that is also something that we are uh, very much uh, working on. So I would stop here, um, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. So the minister changed the topic, rightly so, to supporting young entrepreneurs, especially women, in developing countries. And I think uh, that is a very good intervention um, from your side, sir. Let us um, turn to uh, the second speaker, the chairman of the other board, Patrick Losch. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Uh, we at ADA spent quite a lot of time the last years to rethink our strategy, considering the evolution of the world in, in these days. And we have now a new strategic plan we started to implement from this year on. And we have three priorities. And by co not by coincidence, but <laughs> the first priority are the young entrepreneurs. And uh, second, we want to focus on producers of food and wood and the entrepreneurs of the value chain in the rural world. And third, we want to support the providers and consumers of basic decentralized services. And we do this also considering three transversal subjects, which are gender, as I it, climate, and digitization. So, sorry, Minister, that I, I repeat your words, but it, it's like that, no? <laughs> For the young entrepreneurship access, uh, we know that we need innovative financing mechanisms adapted to you, the young entrepreneurs' challenges. Here are some ideas. We have already implemented revenue-based funding. That means you repay as you earn your money as an entrepreneur, and not simply according to an, a predefined rule of repaying. Finding new forms of guarantees for the young entrepreneurs especially finding medium and long-term financing and finding the most difficult to find, soft capital. And then we need, because just giving financing is not enough, we need, we need that we have to couple that with technical assistance, non-financial services. And training and coaching programs are essential. We need entrepreneurial and managerial skills training, we need training for investment readiness, and we need business network development. And we need to facilitate market access, provide sector-specific information about markets, connect to providers and to distributors or consumers within your value chain, update, give updates on technolo technological evolution. And this should always be done according to our new strategy, taking into consideration the three transversal subjects, gender, which means make sure that programs and products we design are always designed the way that women are not disadvantaged. For example, if we are in the rural world and you give credits and you ask as a guarantee uh, the title of, of land, it, it, will, it won't work, because title of land, unfortunately, are normally with the men. So you, you cannot develop a product like that. You have to find other solutions. And then uh, we have the climate issue. We want to have climate 
positive or climate, at least climate neutral activities, and digitization, uh, which is a subject, especially among the young, very uh, receptive for the young ones. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. I appreciate those words. And I must say, I appreciate the discipline of our panel members as well. Um, <laughs> We are coming to you, Alfred, uh, some uh, words to share on your strategy and what you focus on. Thanks. Yeah, <coughs> thank you so much, uh, Gerald, and also thanks for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, it was actually not 2005, uh, it was 2006, just to be clear <laughs> for the record. Um, <laughs> uh, but it doesn't make a big difference, I suppose. But uh, let me first of all say um, not only thanks for the organizers, um, that we can have this uh, exchange today, but also just thanking you for giving us a flavor of freedom that I think many of us have not been used to in the last two years. And I think optimists among ourselves always thought that there's light at the end of the tunnel, but others maybe thought there's no light at the end of the tunnel, but I think now we can see the light. And I think we are very happy that you can provide us with this. And I'm particularly very excited about this is our first event in Luxembourg, face to face, so thanks, that's really great. Now, um, let me uh, perhaps first commend um, the Luxembourg government uh, for, for the great partnership that we are having here, the thought leadership, uh, prioritization of shared areas of policy priority, uh, which is financial inclusion of women, as you know, and it's in fact a pity that we don't have a mixed panel here, but maybe next time we can do better. Um, and of course, we are also looking at other vulnerable populations, such as the younger ones, um, um, climate, um, inclusive green finance, as we call it. And um, uh, commending the Luxembourg government, of course, uh, cannot go without also commending our partners, ADA and SIGAP, who are also here on the table. And I think we all share the same um, drive towards getting closer to the realization of the Sustainable Development Goal. Goal one, which is no, no poverty, um, the goal five, gender equality, um, goal 13, climate action, and goal 17, partnership for goals. And I'm saying this because financial regulators in developing and emerging economies are more and more getting engaged and realizing these goals. And this is an interesting development because so many years ago, I think, <laughs> Gerald, you will remember, uh, central banks were oftentimes very engaged in development issues and they were actually blamed uh, for that. And then uh, the pendulum swung into the, the different direction and they were just focusing on monetary and later on macro prudential. But now we do see a trend that central banks and other financial regulators again are looking after development issues. And we call it contemporary financial regulation because many of the regulators have actually started to incorporate gender issues, inclusive green finance and even serving the younger populations into their mandates. And I think this is a great development and I think we should keep this momentum. So I just wanted to say that we are on the same page here. Now, um, the AFI network has actually done quite a bit uh, on the sustainable development goals and the related areas. Normally we work through commitments. So we have a couple of accords that we usually agree upon once a year. We couldn't do, it, uh, couldn't do that since Kigali 2019. But we had a couple of milestones I just want to share. One was 2016 in Fiji, then our action plan. It's actually the commitment on narrowing down the gender gap yeah, in financial inclusion. But not only that, we're also looking into issues such as women leadership, yeah, women participation. Um, and as you know, many of the central banks don't have female leaders. So we are actually also trying to build female leadership in these institutions so that we can have a more balanced uh, management structure in these institutions as well. And of course, there are a couple of capacity building activities around that. Uh, but also on green, uh, we have the Sharm el-Sheikh Accord, which calls for action for central banks on actually working on the lower ends of these markets to incorporate yeah, um, financial um, inclusion when we think about green finance. And then there was finally also the Kigali statement which is a statement that really looks into uh, those who are actually not attended, the forgotten ones maybe, the younger ones, uh, forcibly displaced persons, again women, but also we are looking increasingly into the elderly because we also want to make sure that those ones do not drop out of the system. So you can see there is a 
broad range of commitments where countries are coming together and where financial regulators are now taking action. Also on MSME finance, the Maputo Accord for Mozambique, also a very important one. So I just wanted to share with you these uh, broader frameworks and hopefully we have a bit of time to talk also about now this topic, which is um, supporting young entrepreneurs in developing countries, which we, of course, we see from a regulator's perspective, which is also looking at the risks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alfred. And I must say that this changing wind uh, that we see where regulators are far more interested in these issues is something that we also observed and we like to refer to us all working towards the same outcomes uh, for people on the ground. Now, um, we have the lay of the land, what you are focusing on, but you have experience in your organizations, uh, in your positions. So what I would like you to do is quickly, just around the table, uh, tell us about the lessons of the past, maybe just one lesson, past work, and how that influences what you are going to do in the future on this topic. So uh, let's start with you again, uh, Minister, and then we change it around this time, then Alfred and then Patrick, keeping you on your toes here. Yes, well, uh, thank you. you uh, maybe the first um, lesson that we, we, have, uh, we have learned over the years is that um, uh, innovative products, products and channels uh, such as digital savings can be um, an effective means of increasing access um, and usage of financial services uh, by women. Financial literacy is also uh, an important skill to foster financial uh, inclusion of the most vulnerable groups, uh, including uh, underserved um, uh, women. Now, of course, uh, there are a number of MFIs that have um, uh, risen uh, to this challenge. Uh, Patrick Loesch has, um, has um, spoken about this in his um, introductory remark, but that it, there is, of course, much more uh, that, needs, uh, that needs to be done. We have last year um, adopted a new uh, strategy on, uh, on gender uh, at uh, Luxembourg Development Corporation, which is a transversal, uh, horizontal um, um, strategy and which of course also uh, includes um, uh, the finan finance, finances and everything we do in, in inclusive uh, finance. So this is really something that very much spans all our, all our actions and also uh, involves looking at all these problems through the gender lens, um, as uh, Patrick pointed out, uh, making sure that we don't there also we adopt uh, adhere to the do no harm uh, principle and that we make sure that all these instruments that we are uh, promoting also works work um, for, uh, for, for, uh, for women. Uh, another aspect is um, uh, technical assistance and capacity building as it was said before, you cannot just provide finance. Uh, there is also a, an aspect of um, uh, financial uh, literacy, financial education that goes with it um, to um, make sure that um, uh, women know how to use um, the uh, instruments that are provided uh, to them in, in a very specific uh, context. And there again, one example was given uh, of um, uh, finan fin fin financing in, uh, in, in the developing world. Um, so that is an another uh, important um, point. And there, an example is partners such as uh, AFI, which is um, uh, represented here by Dr. Hanik, where we have a common understanding that there is a need to have an overarching gender lens uh, approach. And it is uh, good to hear that you are assisting regulators in ident identifying gender-specific uh, policy gaps and addressing them with uh, innovative, smart um, policy sol solutions. We also support uh, CGAP, who has a vision for gender equity and financial inclusion, and um, uh, which, uh, and I'm happy that we are going to sign a new agreement in October uh, this um, uh, this year. Uh, maybe uh, also to mention that uh, we renewed our support um, to ADA to finance the cost of its um, activities for the period 2022-2024. And I'm particularly happy um, to hear that gender is, is such a, a strong um, priority in, in, your, um, in your action. Uh, and then we are doing, uh, also putting the, the, uh, the, the, the subject on the forefront of our coming 
uh, initiatives. Uh, for instance, this year's European Microfinance Award focus will be on financial inclusion uh, that works for women. Uh, so there uh, also I think um, we see that this is really something that is becoming more and more central um, and I think that's, that is definitely to be welcomed. Thank you very much. Yes. No, no, the, sec the, the, the sequence has changed, so it's Alfred yeah, now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Are you sure? Yes, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Good, great. Okay. Uh, well, you're asking me uh, for the for the maybe the big lesson here, and, and I can um, maybe I can introduce this uh, just by picking one sentence that I found in your documents on this conference uh, that picked really my attention, and it read, "Young people are more willing to take risks." are more educated and can keep up with the latest technologies. That was a sentence in the, in the um, session brief. And this is actually the lesson, the big one. No? Young people find technology in their cradle. Yeah? Uh, they, they get used to technology different, I think, from our experience. And perhaps they have a different um, view on risk taking. Maybe they don't consider a risk what we consider a risk, especially when it comes to use of financial services. Maybe they like it to use or to be subject of the use of artificial intelligence, while others say it's a threat. Maybe they like it. Maybe they like to find everything with a simple mouse click, and everyone knows their customer preferences because there's digital transparency. Maybe they like that. Maybe my kids will actually act like that in the future. And we have acted completely different, and we have defined the risks completely differently. And this has an important impact, and I think you said you talk about people yeah, on the demand side. And I think that is where behavioral economics comes in, and where we look at the behavioral patterns of the younger ones when it comes to the use of financial services. And I think this is an extremely important point because the financial services now are not coming from places like Luxembourg, I can say, for these younger people in this sense because they are online platforms, they are crowdfunding platforms. They find uh, a lot of NBFIs, non-bank non financial institutions, to serve their needs. Who regulates these ones? It's often not the traditional regulator. There's an impact on the financial industry, but there's also an impact on the regulatory architecture. For example, in Malaysia, we have a good example here. Um, the Security Commission is actually now looking after uh, P2P uh, crowdfunding platforms, no longer the central bank. So that's an interesting change. And I think these lessons keep us busy, and that now encourages us to produce regulatory responses that are tailored to the needs of these younger people who actually have a different risk perspective. I think this is a very important point I wanted to make, and there are examples we can share, again, from developing economies and emerging countries, how they are dealing with these new challenges. That's a really interesting um, discussion for the future, and I think it will keep us busy way beyond our time in these institutions. Yes. So at ADA, we have since 2004 already experience in financing young entrepreneurs. And what we learned from that is a bit brutally <laughs> said is that offering microcredits credits to young people has proven to be per pertinent but not sufficient. No? Uh, maybe you can say it allows people or young people to survive but de definitely not enough to develop themselves into entrepreneurs. So taking this in mind, is, uh, what, why is it like that? First, IMFs are, um, MFIs, sorry. <laughs> MFIs are limited with the uh, amount of money and limited in, in the time frame, the duration they offer as credits. Uh, you can finance working capital, but definitely you can't finance investments. Microfinance institutions are, by definition, financial institutions and offering financial and organization and assistance, non-financial non services, is for them definitely a big um, challenge. And 
and who pays for it? No? That's, a, that's a big issue also in it. Huh? Who pays for that? And then another very important point is that uh, we try to address as many as possible young people, huh? people finishing their school or people wanting to start their business. But are they true entrepreneurs? <laughs> uh, or are they only the entrepreneurs by default? Huh? And is everybody able to become an entrepreneur? You, you, you have to be aware of this. The good news is that many more people than we have today could be entrepreneurs, but not ever, the bad news in that sense is not everybody can become an entrepreneur. And then we have also an, a good news for the gender subject is that the main, uh, the crucial elements to become a good entrepreneur are not culturally or are not de 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 defined by the by the formal structure of your environment, but they are more personal uh, elements, talent, passion, dedication. And these are uh, elements, these are talents you find as well, maybe even more often among women than am among men. So these are the really the, the, the points which matter to, to become an entrepreneur. And in that, uh, lesson learned, we, we tried to find, or we, we found that on the, in the ecosystem out in, 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 in the south, we have this new concept of incubators or of accelerators. So these are, uh, they are working in a startup logic. They are totally in a different world. No? They are chasing the unicorns, but producing a lot of waste. No, a waste is kind of human waste, no? Because they have many candidates and they train them and at the end of the day, the winner takes it all. No? It's only one who gets the prize money. And all the others have done all the programs of, of uh, training, but they, nobody gives them financing. And they are perhaps not the best of the cohort, but they are definitely not bad. And here comes an, an, an interesting point that we thought that maybe it is a very good way to get into financing young entrepreneurs is taking advantage of this work being done by the incubators or accelerators, having pre-selected the right people, having offered them very well done training, which is being subsidized, by the way, from other sources than, than the microfinance industry, and then step in to offer the finance, appropriate financing for these people and really allow for the development of true entrepreneurs who at the end of the day can also employ the others who are not able to become entrepreneurs. It's sort of uh, surfing the same wave. Yeah, yeah trying to <laughs> yeah, trying to combine. No, it's, uh, <laughs> trying I, I, to combine I, and, I and have I think something to dig deeper into. Mm -hmm. But for now you mentioned something that is slightly worrying because we often see, uh, let's get young people involved, let's focus on them, let's integrate them. You just used the word integration several times. But uh, what, what, what is needed to strike the right balance between financially supporting young entrepreneurs in emerging markets against saddling them with debt they might never be able to repay? And, uh, and why don't we just start there and we work our way back here to the minister at last. Yeah, I, definitely this is, anyway, it should be the first preoccupation of whoever is in microfinance is to avoid over in depthness. And especially in this area no, where it is obvious, an entrepreneurship is with higher risk than whatever other activity. We know it. it. It's like that. So this higher risk has to be addressed. And it has th we have to find solutions how to, to avoid that we destroy a person just because he failed. And maybe it was not his, his fault that he failed because maybe there were some situations which led, it, led him to that, that point. And it's absolutely right that we should never design a product in a way that at the end of the day, the person who has the courage to become an entrepreneur is not having the Damocles 
<laughs> sword of buff or the the, the cord around around the neck all the time. He he is out there, and we we have to be innovative and find the right solutions for it. And there comes back to the the element I called before, like soft capital. So we have to 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 find the way how to get into this impact financing mood or impact financing wave and get out from there the, the necessary capital to, to, to keep this risk at a reasonable level for the entrepreneurs in the South. Thank you, Thank you very much. And I, I neglected to say that this is a question that came from the audience and not one person, four people ask this question. So this is where I got this question and we thought it's an interesting one to address because it covers so many facets around us. Four the different speakers on the on the panel. Uh, Alfred? Yeah, no, from my side, yeah. As I said, there are a couple of examples uh, that we can quote how regulators are actually responding um, to these uh, um, challenges. And I think one point that also comes through what you are saying I just discussed this morning with one of my colleagues. It's actually the, the first 18 months no? in a young business that, that is so important where you need uh, support, where you need uh, um, even the non-financial support that you mentioned, but also perhaps uh, a solid provision of financial services during that time. And we know that many of the startups actually drop out uh, after 18 months and only a few can make it. So I think it's very important that uh, the regulatory responses are designed in a way um, that uh, there is solidi so, uh, solidity in these markets, um, that these um, uh, young entrepreneurs uh, actually can make it. But um, I think um, one answer to the solution, again, I think lies on the demand side. Uh, and to your question, I think there are a couple of interesting examples to mention on digital financial literacy, uh, where actually um, young uh, entrepreneurs can also get access to, yeah, that's also fintech apps, that can educate them how to deal um, with financial services, digital financial services in a better way that can actually avoid um, over indebtedness. So you need to know more about that. I mean, you know these examples from Luxembourg, from other developed economies. Um, when I go to Northern Europe, like Finland or Sweden, where you actually can't buy a coffee with cash any longer, you need a card. Even when you go to a restroom, you need to put your credit card. It's, um, it's quite incredible. And of course, um, these countries have also come forward with interesting um, approaches. Um, but we also have in our network quite a number of approaches on digital literacy. For example, Egypt, um, uh, Nile Entrepreneurs is one of the examples where they, together with the university, have actually prepared a program uh, for young entrepreneurs to better understand uh, how to avoid issues such as over indebtedness. So I think this is very important and I think this is uh, definitely the future. There is more to come. Yeah. Is there some final words on this question? Yeah, well, I uh, think I have to be um, uh, very humble here on this. Uh, I think it's um, definitely, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's quite a, a technical uh, question and I think while we can uh, provide general responses. So you really need to get uh, uh, on the ground to, to get the right responses to this. I think it's, it's very important uh, that one takes into consideration the, um, the local context, um, but also the social cultural context of, of each place and of the local entrepreneurs. And maybe it would be better to have some young um, female entrepreneurs sitting up here to answer that question from all the different regions. Uh, uh, in, in the world where we are, we are active. Obviously, we are listening to what our partners tell us, uh, other MFIs. Um, uh, every time I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in one of our partner countries and when, when we visit um, uh, small and uh, micro enterprises who benefit from uh, microcredits, uh, I ask them what the rates are, what the conditions of the loans are, because I think the, the local context is, is so important and you see that every time it is different, um, it is uh, with collateral, without co collateral it's part, there is some part of grant, some part of, uh, of debt involved, obviously uh, overburdening uh, entrepreneurs with debt is uh, probably never a good idea, but I, th I think again, uh, the local uh, context um, is, is so important and um, 
Uh, and I think that that is really something one needs to take into consideration also. I think again, um, in, in uh, looking at gender, one should not um, just superpose our um, Western thinking into, into, into the local context. I think that is uh, definitely one, uh, one very good um, uh, groundwork for, for failure in, in doing that. Um, so I, I would say, look at, look at the local context. Of course, we are trying to do, as development corporation, putting in place our instruments, uh, continue to develop the, uh, our, fi our inclusive finance ecosystem, put in place uh, blended finance funds such, a, such as SDG 500, uh, which are quite successful and uh, which are really also uh, helping to, to get us there. But um, uh, yes, I think that's no, what I, I would have to say to that. <laughs> I, I can tell you, you can be humble and say this is an applied thing, but your answer is spot on in terms of context. And the one word that we haven't used, but that, that were implied here, is um, how do we break down the norms, the gendered social norms in those areas, the rules that society makes uh, in those areas to get more women involved and participative, but also with that uh, approach of responsibility that we should have in terms of not o looking, not causing over indebtedness, etc. Now, we are very short on time, but there are three more questions that I really want our panel to quickly address. And maybe if you have a final sort of statement, please use the time for that as well. And I'm going to start with you, Minister. Uh, and this is also questions from uh, the audience that they sent to us beforehand. Many programs exist for youth entrepreneurship in developing countries. How does the strategic priority of Luxembourg and the global microfinance sector manifest itself? But I think the emphasis here is on where do you fit in and add value uh, as Luxembourg? Well, as I said in my introduction, uh, what, I, uh, what I see is that um, uh, people are, are quite impressed by what we have created here. We have, um, uh, we have a, an inclusive finance uh, ecosystem that includes um, microfinance uh, includes uh, microinsurance, includes regula regulate, regulatory uh, issues. Um, uh, we have a, a green, uh, green stock exchange that more and more uh, lists um, um, socially responsible uh, bonds. Uh, we have a uh, more traditional banking sector which is getting there and I think there is uh, increased uh, appetite uh, among, uh, among investors for uh, SRA. Uh, instrument, SRI instruments, uh, ESG-based uh, um, uh, um, um, uh, instruments, uh, investments, and I think all this together, um, I think, is, is quite is quite unique. Uh, there aren't there aren't many places in the world that have this comprehensive um, um, uh, ecosystem and this this comprehensive value proposition that you can can offer to uh, partners, multilateral partners, and we are working, for instance, now with. Um, UN Women on a, on a gender bond, uh, which we would like to list also on the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. We are working, uh, the, uh, Monsieur Donge mentioned the, the social bond that is being set up. Um, these are all things that are, that, are, uh, that are, yes, created and developed here in Luxembourg and which, uh, which can really make a, make a difference when I think the whole world, world has realized that indeed we need to leverage um, also private finance uh, to, reach, uh, to reach the SDGs. I think that's not just a slogan, that is reality. And I think it is also quite well in phase with the expectations of, um, of, um, of investors um, everywhere. Thank you very much for that. And I think you are really an example here how to leverage the private sector for development. So thank you for that. Uh, let us go to uh, 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 Patrick, uh, please. Um, your question is, uh, what kind of financial products should be developed by microfinance institutions to support young entrepreneurs in developing countries? Now, you already started going in that direction. Can you add something? And, yeah. and, and also remember, I invited you to make, maybe make a final statement. You, you're most okay. welcome. Mm -hmm. You have two minutes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, first of all, financial products are not enough to do to solve whatever problem we are facing here. So we need to combine it with 
non-financial services in some way or, or the other. And the main issues we need, as we s um, concentrated before our efforts on the I uh, MFIs, today we have to concentrate our efforts on the cooperation, on the links between FMIs and, uh, and other organizations, other institutions which are there, which are on the other hand, which have capacities to, for training, have capacities for support and technology and whatever, but who are lacking the financing. So it, it is a win-win situation. And uh, we see when we talk about the gender issue, we, we see that there, uh, for example, in Senegal, there's a women investment club uh, we can work with. In Central America, there's a regional, regional women's entrepreneurship program, which has also been supported by Luxdef, by the way. And we can work with this. And then we see also a very interesting uh, element is that some incubators have a strategic focus on entrepreneurship, enter entrepreneurship related to the environment. No? And here comes our subjects as agro agroecology or the activities in the food and wood value chain, circular economy, all these elements are being supported here. And we can organize this no? so that financing is being used for something purposeful. And it not, but not, not for the financing by itself, but for the solution, for, the, uh, for what it is being done, uh, used for. No? So that, we, that is, I think, the very, very uh, most important element I would ta f uh, take. And uh, just to, to add also, for example, the decentralized basic services, which are linked to the circular economy, are perfectly uh, fitting into this. And so we get a real beautiful all-in package. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and the fact that you emphasize partnerships is very important because I've heard it quite often here. Alfred, the last uh, word is yours. Um, so two, you. three minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question is, how do policymakers and regulators in developing and emerging markets view the, their role in advancing the financial inclusion of young people. Now, you've already started mm -hmm. on the path of telling us mm. that there's a, a change, but yeah. maybe a little bit more and what kind of instruments? Yeah. Okay, now, uh, two minutes. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, not, let's not waste uh, the time, but uh, no, there are various ways that we are observing. I, I can just pick the four examples. Uh, one that we see increasingly is that regulators now also uh, collect uh, not only sex disaggregate, disaggregated data, but also age disaggregated data when it comes to uh, the development of, of national strategies. So really uh, segmenting uh, what you're looking for and better understanding uh, the people out there by actually collecting the right data. That's one. Uh, the second one um, I think you're also aware of is that regulators increasingly and policymakers increasingly um, include uh, youth financial inclusion into the national strategy frameworks. Uh, uh, there's also a development. It started with gender. Now we have inclusive green. Now we see increasingly youth financial inclusion within the national strategy framework. That's another very important one. Then we have a couple of regulatory responses, and I already touched upon this a little bit. Here, let me just mention, for example, Costa Rica. They have a, a um, uh, a movable uh, collateral registry now, uh, mandated by, by law, where actually um, also um, immovable um, uh, collateral can be registered, which is of course a big help for those ones who cannot provide traditional collateral. So here the regulator has also provided a solution to the market. And then finally, you mentioned partnerships. Basically, uh, the partnership, public-private partnerships between regulators and private sector especially when it comes to uh, these fintech solutions for digital financial literacy and others. So these are four that I would say. For the final word, um, I mean, from the experience that uh, we are privileged to gain, you know, from, from the countries out there, I think it is important, and I think I come back to your point on, on the context. Yeah, the, um, we al always have to see the local context. And I would go a bit further and say, we need actually local solutions for the global challenges. It's actually not the other way around. Yeah? So I think we are learning so much about all the knowledge that is scattered in pockets around the globe that we need to mobilize this knowledge, bring it together, and then make it available for those ones who would like to adapt it 
and then adopt it in their own context. And I think this is where question on Luxembourg, where I think we are very happy uh, to be here as well, because there's global convergence around these issues, yeah? like on the challenges, but also on the solutions. It is no longer just, just the North or the South or the poor or the rich who have the solutions. They're everywhere. And we actually have to bring them together and make it available for others. And that is where the convergence calls for everyone to come together. And I think that's where the Luxembourg ecosystem also can play a great role. Thank you. Thank you very much. Powerful final words. And uh, I must tell you that I really, really enjoyed this. I, I, I feel we should make it, uh, uh, and I don't know what the French is for evening of microfinance, because it can be longer and more discussion, because I, I see a lot of discussion is still possible, and, and uh, the audience also want to engage. But luckily, we have a little function afterwards where you're all invited to so that we can engage. But I want to make a couple of uh, sort of points that, that just sort of emanated from what you were saying. Uh, the focus on women, very important here. Integration of people into the social economic environment, but in society. Um, understanding people, understanding the local context, but understanding young people, not seeing them as an amorphous mass but looking at the profiles and see what do we have to do and co-create with them to solve these problems, to meet these challenges. You mentioned innovative mechanisms adapted to, bespoke designed. Well, I added bespoke designed, but that's fine. And then digital focus, tremendous focus on digital technology. Uh, but we also have to be careful that we don't leave people behind because they don't have access to that technology and the means. Um, I know in your policies you say a lot about SMEs and agriculture, um, and uh, that I picked up as well when reading through. Climate change as a challenge that we all have to face, all came through the green investment instruments, uh, mentioning it as something that we have to consider. And then finally, partnerships, linking institutions, the power of the future as a loan we cannot achieve much. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart for this. It was absolutely worth every minute coming to here from, uh, from Paris and facilitating this. So really, really thank you. I also want to thank you, the, uh, thanks to the, the, the Luxembourg Directorate for Development Cooperation, the people who worked on making this happen together with ADA, together with Infini, uh, Luxembourg, really uh, a great, um, a great uh, initiative, the MIDI, and getting this together. And um, um, I also want to thank people on the Ada Live YouTube channel that, that uh, sort of dialed in and said, I want to listen to this today. But lastly, I want to thank the audience. You have been a patient, attentive audience. Thank you for your questions. Today we didn't go in live audience questions because we wanted to control this in one hour, but now you have your chance afterwards. Uh, so you are most welcome to join us uh, outside for a light uh, function. Thank you very much, everybody.